Good morning. Hopefully you remember uh, last year we were in a section of scripture from John chapter 13. We made it all the way to John chapter 15. And so we're going to pick up there today and we're going to be in John 16 and 17 over the next couple weeks. So this is what we talked about as the sermon at the end. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the sermon at the beginning, and this is kind of sermon at the end. This is the last words of Jesus before he is arrested and taken to the cross. So that's where we're going to be, John 13 through 17, but specifically we're going to be in John 16 and 17 to finish up this section. You might also want to put your finger in 1 Peter 3 because we're going to go there today based on what Jesus is talking about and what he wants us to consider today. And it's a fun topic, right? I just, you know, you can't pick this stuff, right? It's a Super Bowl Sunday. Everybody's grouped for their team, right? It's supposed to be exciting. You know what we're going to talk about? Persecution, okay? I guess we could say some of you are going to feel that after the game. I don't know, right? You're going to be on going, oh, don't, don't pick on me. I know they lost. I don't want to talk about it, okay? Maybe, okay? I don't know. I'm looking for, for something here because I'm, I'm like, really? There's the topic this morning. So uh, John 16, the first four verses is all we're going to look at this morning. But these are some really powerful things. Jesus knows what's about to happen. He knows what's going to happen to his followers. And maybe now more than ever, he's talked about persecution before in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. So he's talked about it before, but now he's really going to tell them, hey, you, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Listen, this is coming. This is going to happen. Are you prepared for that? So here it goes. I have told you all these things so that you will not fall away. Because that's what he's concerned about. If you get persecuted, if, if you are being challenged because you believe in me and follow me, you'll fall away. You'll be like, out of here. There's something better to give my life to than this, okay, if this is what I'm going to face. So he's like, just understand, I want you to be prepared so that you don't fall away. He starts, he says, they will put you out of the synagogue, okay? They're going to kick you out. No, you follow this. What? No, 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 no. We got rid of Jesus. We got rid of Jesus. We crucified him, okay? We got rid of him. And he, he says, no, they're going to put you out. They're going to put you out. They're going to say, no, you can't follow him. That was a fake Messiah. He was not real, okay? No, if you're going to bring Jesus in here, nope, nope, and we're going to throw you out. He's like, that's going to happen. You better be prepared. And in fact, what's fascinating is you can read the book of Acts and see that's exactly what happened to them. That's exactly what took place. Quite often they would show up at the synagogue and they would preach and they would declare and there they go, they're getting kicked out. That's what's happening. That's what's taking place. So he says, I've told you these things so that you won't fall away. You need to know they're going to put you out of the synagogue, okay? And just because he wants to up the mood in the room, he says, yet yeah, a time is coming when the one who kills you, can you imagine what that was like? Kill? Did he just say kill? Did he say kill? Did he say we could die for this? What? You know, I I'm sure many of them maybe didn't understand that level of persecution that they were going to face. A time's coming when the one who kills you, now follow along with this because we have a real specific example in scripture that we're going to see this morning that many of you will already remember as we're reading through this. Who will kill you? By the way, when they do so, they will think that he is offering a service to God. Okay? It's, it's not just they're going to get rid of you. Do you think they are doing it because God told me to do this? Okay, I, I am in service for God. I don't know who you people are following this Jesus, but they will put you to death and they will think in doing so, they are actually doing God's work and God's will as they do that. Wow. They will do these things. Why? This is huge. This is what we've been talking about, folks. Because they have not known the Father or me. Now, I don't know, but I, I got into this and I thought of two specific things. One's going to be a question that we're going to come up. The first one is, do you understand we have this in, in Acts 9? That, that as Saul is going around, who we later know as Paul, as he's going around and he's making it his personal life mission to end this thing called the way. These people who follow this Jesus, who they say rose again. I mean, he's just, he's just committed. 
I'm going to go and I'm going to find him in every single place and I'm going to get rid of him. Okay? That was his life mission. And he had a lot of zeal, a lot of passion to see that happen. And so, so much so that now after, and you can read this in Acts 8, they disperse after the stoning of Stephen and the murder, the first martyr of the church. They, they, they go everywhere. They disperse. Okay? They're like, Maybe it's better in another town than Jerusalem. Now, there's still a bunch that are in Jerusalem, but they move out. So guess what Saul does? Well, this is no fun. They all left. I'm going to go after them. So he goes to the high priest, whether that's Annas or Caiaphas. It's someone in that family, and he asks for a letter. And the letter says, this is Saul. Give him what he wants, okay? He has rights to go into the synagogue. He has rights to fight followers of this way of this Jesus, and to go take care of them, okay? And that's his letter. And that's what he's doing as he's going to Damascus that day. I got my letter in hand. I'm going to find all these people. It's not good enough that you left Jerusalem. I'm going to hunt you down. I mean, that's this guy's mindset as he is on the road to Damascus, and Jesus shows up, and boom, no, no, stop. Do you ever notice what he said? Okay, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? These are the words of Jesus. You ever notice what he says right after that? What's the first thing out of his mouth? Who are you? Can we go back? Because what does he just say? They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. And that's all the proof you need to know. That the first thing out of his mouth is, well, who are you? Who are you that is stopping me dead in my tracks? That's saying, stop. Who are you? Because I don't know who you are. He doesn't know who he is. It's like, wow. Now, I'm just going to tell you, this brings up a disturbing question that you might not like to ask, but it's going to be really important to ask. Because the question is going to be this, okay? Uh, and it goes right along with our, our, our verse this year. What do we want to do? We want to know the Lord Jesus more intimately. Why? Do we know what we're capable? Look, look at this. They will do these things because they don't know the Father or me. Saul's terrorizing the church thinking he's offering service to God as he isn't. So may I ask you this? Do you know what you're capable of apart from the Lord? Apart from knowing the Lord, do you know what you're capable of? Now, there's two ways to take this. The first way is, do you understand, okay, the absolute mess you are capable of making, okay, in your own life with sin with apart from knowing the Lord? Do you understand? Do you understand? You are a wrecking. You and me, we're, we're wrecking balls, okay? And without knowing the Lord, we will come in and we'll destroy everything. We'll destroy marriages, families, all sorts of things, okay, without knowing the Lord. So that's the first part of it. Second part's even more disturbing. I'm sorry, okay? Do you know what you're capable of thinking you are serving God, but you're not? That's a disturbing, that's a really, I know, I know, I know, I I. I heard the voice of Dan all week saying, don't ask the question if you don't want the answer, okay? I heard all week, and I'm sorry, Dan, I ignored it, okay? I ignored it because I think this is really important. I think it is really important. Do we know what we're capable of thinking we are serving God, but we are not? And I'm like, oh, that's disturbing. And if we would know the Lord more, we'd, we'd know because he'd say, what are you doing? I, I know you think you're serving me. You think you're doing good. No, 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 no. No, no. Look, look, look at the carnage. Look at the things that are happening from the things you think you are doing in my name serving me. Look at that. Look what you're doing. I, that's just really, you know, I, I've told you before, I get, I get emails about things happening in church world, and a lot of them, are, I'm just telling you, they, they're not in the news because they're good. Okay, it's just like our news, right? It's just like our news. You don't turn it on to find all these great stories, okay? Now, I'm certain, right, they put a, put a nice story in the middle somewhere so you're not totally depressed by the end, but it's all bad, 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 bad. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. There, I, I don't get emails telling me, hey, this church baptized 500 people last Sunday, okay? I, I get the emails telling me the, the, the pastor did this and the church is blown up and people have gone their own ways, and, and people have left the faith. Th- those are the emails I get, okay? And I have to keep asking that question. Do I know what I'm capable of apart from knowing the Lord? Apart from knowing the Lord, do I know what I'm capable of? Do you know 
what you're capable of apart from knowing the Lord, that you think you are doing his will. You think you are serving him. You think you are doing things in his name. But the end result of that, the end of that, it doesn't look that way. It isn't good. It isn't fruit that's, that's being born. It isn't, it isn't those things. And Jesus is warning them, saying, do you understand this? Okay, they're going to think they're serving me. They are not. And the question we ought to ask constantly is, do I know what I'm capable of apart from knowing the Lord and being in his word so I know who he is, so I know what he's asking me to do, so I know that I'm doing it his way? Saul could have said, man, I'm, I'm, a guy, I'm all about truth. I'm all about truth. I don't know. I'm all about truth. And yet the way he carried that out because he wasn't open to Jesus was the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for, led to all sorts of destruction in his path. We have no idea because we're just given a few stories about Saul. Saul tells himself, tells us later as Paul, that he is chief among sinners. Okay, that, that's, how, that's how he talked about himself. Okay, We get a very, just a little brief look into him, and, and he's like, I, I, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Without Christ, I am nothing. Without knowing him, I am nothing. And he, and he just makes this his pursuit. And I think it's because of what happened on that day when he said, Who are you, Lord? I don't know you. I don't know you. I should know you. I'm the man who's studied and learned and sat under all the great rabbis. I should know you, but I don't. And that's why we've made that our pursuit this year our pursuit of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ more intimately. So I know that what I am doing is actually what God desires for me to do. That is so important, to do the right things in the right way that God would be glorified in all that is done. Here's the last verse. But I've told you these things, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told you about them. Jesus is saying, I just, I want you to know. I want you to know. Their time is coming. They're going to be here. They're going to do these things. I want you to be prepared for that time. So you know, the persecution of followers of Jesus continues to this day. We were on the phone last week uh, with, with uh, Jill's uncle, who lives in Michigan. And he said, at his church that day was a man who escaped Iran. And the reason he had to escape was because he converted to Christianity, okay? And they didn't go, yay, woo, you're a Christ follower, okay? And that's not what they did, okay? The death threats went up. If he had stayed, he would have been killed. And so he came to America, and he came, and he now shares his story about what it was like to follow Jesus, to come out of the world that he was in, to follow Christ, and knowing to do so was going to get a bounty on his head. And so just so you know, it continues to this day. So what you remember, this is where I want you to turn to First Peter. Because I think Peter echoes a little bit. We're going to look at a few verses in First Peter 3 that I think Peter is going back to this time and saying, I need to prepare all of you as he's writing his letter. I need to prepare you for persecution. I need you to be prepared for when things are hard and things are tough and things are difficult. I need you prepared for those days. Those days where, where people are not happy that you're a Christ follower. That there are no points. There are no bonuses. It's just the opposite. You're now a threat. You're now a threat to be a Christ follower. You are now uh, considered uh, bad, okay? You, you're going to have a bad influence. You're going to change things the wrong way to be a Christ follower. It happens in some areas currently of our own culture and time. So what should we remember? Here we go. We're going to be in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 17. Here we go. For who is going to harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Right? That, that's part of it. Who, who's going to harm you? Because remember, remember Jesus talked about often. Listen, I, your soul, mine, okay? You should fear the one who has control over the soul. And he goes, you're worried about everything else. Worry about your life is in my hands. I will take care of you. 
Okay, Who's going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good? But in fact, if you happen to suffer for what doing what is right, you are blessed. Hey, that's not something else you never thought about today. Oh, I'm blessed when, when that happens. I'm blessed when I suffer for doing the right thing. That, that, that should be a blessing. It just doesn't feel that way. I'm going to tell you that. It doesn't feel that way. It's not going to feel good. The other people are not going to say, wow, what a great blessing that that was in your life. Okay? You're not going to think of it that way. But he says, if you're suffering for doing what is right, you are blessed. But do not be terrified of them or be shaken. Right? I want you to be terrified. I want you to be worried. Oh, no, they're going to pass that bill. Oh, no. Okay? Don't be terrified of them. Don't be shaken. You don't have to be fearful. I am in charge. I am in control. God showed this in other times, in other kingdoms. Okay? Could you imagine what Daniel thought? Oh, ah, law passed. Pray. Go meet the lions. Ah, maybe I won't pray. Okay? Maybe I'll just close the curtains, okay, before I pray, okay? And, and, and he did what? Nope. He was not terrified of them. This is taken from the Psalms. He was not terrified of them or shaken. Goes up to the same same window that he prayed to every day because it faced Jerusalem. Up in the curtain, there he is. There he is. He was not terrified of them or shaken. You can go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Here they are for the king, and the king's like, wait a minute. You stand here talking to me like that, right? I'm King Nebuchadnezzar. And again, they were not what? They were not terrified or shaken, okay? Their trust was in the Lord no matter what happened, no matter what took place. They chose not to be terrified, not to be shaken, to depend upon the Lord in that moment. So there have been other kingdoms and other times, past laws, past edicts, did different things in trying to do the same thing, bring about fear, shaken, making you uh, fearful to do what they want. And I'm telling you, if you've not understood this yet, fear is the tool of the enemy all the time. If he can get us scared, he can get us to do things we would not normally do. So that's what his goal is. Get us terrified, get us shaken, get us to do things we wouldn't normally do. But, he says, set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Okay, set him apart. He is Lord. He is your Lord. Okay, I know you're going to live in kingdoms because wh why are you saying he is Lord in your heart? Because a lot of times the kingdom you live in, he is not Lord. He is not. He is not the Lord of the kingdom and the world in which we live. So set him apart that in your life he is Lord. And, by the way, when you do that, always be ready, and I love this, Okay, this, this is a tremendous verse. Many of, you have got, many of you have heard it before. I wanted you to see it in the context it was in. It's in a very different context that we might talk about or think about. Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to do what? To give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. Oh. Yeah, right? That's the apologetic. For, wait a minute. That's the apologetic verse, right? That's the verse where we study and we have all these arguments. So, so I can argue with somebody about, oh, no, that's wrong. And no, That's not even in its context. I, that's why I always tell you, a verse in its context is always more powerful than anything else we do with it. This is like the verse to go learn all this stuff so you can have arguments with people. And that's not even its context. Its context is sometimes you're going to suffer and you have a chance to actually portray hope in the midst of that. And so guess what they're going to do? Well, you better be ready to give an answer because somebody's going to say, wait a minute, how, how, how is that? How, is th how are you that hopeful about what you're going through? Oh, now you can give an answer about the hope you possess. See, again, it's so much better in its context because it's like, oh, there's going to be times when I suffer. There's going to be times when things don't go, and thing, there's going to be pressure whether I'm going to follow Jesus or not, but I'm going to set him apart as Lord, and then I'm going to be ready to give an answer about the hope that I possess. Yet, oh, this is huge. There's a yet. 
There's a gap. There's, there, this is really important, okay? It's not, I can just get in arguments with everybody. Oh, look at this. Yet yeah, do it. Oh, oh, there's a way I should do it as well. Yes. With courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience. So that, right? Well, why am I doing it that way? Why can't I just yell at the person? Why can't I just go on Facebook, right, and just have a nice long post, right, and feel better when I click send? Ah, I feel better. Man, I just made my day doing that, right? Why can't I do that? So that, right, because the result, what, what might God do with that is, is a result. So that those who slander your good conduct, right, those people who are, who are you, you Christian, you terrible, you hate everybody, you hate all these people, so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you. So they might look and say, you accuse that person? Do you understand? This happened in the early church. In fact, uh, there's, there's a great uh, bit of antiquity. It's probably written in the second century uh, by a guy called Pliny, okay? Uh, right? Just uh, right. What a wonderful name. Don't name your kids that, okay? Uh, Pliny. Pliny writes this little thing, and, and, and he's told to go report about the church. So guess what he does? Now he doesn't get to walk into a building like this. He probably walked in the home. Hey, Pliny's here. Wow. Hey, Pliny, come and sit down, okay? And he's sitting there, and they're singing, and he, he listens to everything, listens to the messages shared, the prayers that are going on. And so he has to write back and like, these are the best people I've ever seen. What are we doing persecuting them? That's basically his results, okay? They, they sing. They they they. Praise this, this Jesus as though he's a God. I mean, he was just, it, it's almost like he's writing and just on, like, these are the best, these, these are like the best citizens we have. Why are we persecuting them? Was his conclusion, okay? Because that's all, all he was told. They're terrible, they're awful, they're against the Roman Empire, and he's sitting there going, no. See, they were put to shame by the people who accused those early Christ followers. Because he sat there and he witnessed what God was actually doing in their midst. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if God wills it, than for doing evil. So, let me give you a couple conclusions this morning, okay? Suffering for Jesus is a blessing we should embrace. I don't know if we'll get to embrace it, when, if, how, but it's a blessing we should embrace, Okay, it, it, it's not something we should fear and run away from, okay? And, and I'm telling you, in our culture, more increasingly, um, probably a likelihood down the road that this will take place. But suffering for Jesus is a blessing we should embrace. Don't think something bad's happening to you. Don't think God's upset at you. I don't understand. I shouldn't be suffering. That's why I tell you all the time we live in a broken, fallen world where suffering for the name of Jesus should always be embraced as a blessing. Number two, how you suffer, how you suffer matters to your testimony and opens doors for the salvation of others. Now, we have no idea, okay, what happens to Pliny, okay, down the road. We have no idea, okay? What is amazing, though, is he saw and he heard, and a door, I believe, was open that day. Do you understand that? That's why he says, you're going to have opportunities to share the hope that is within you. And the way you do it matters. Why? Because it matters to your testimony about who you are. And you know what it does? It opens the doors. It goes, wow, never thought about Jesus like that. thought these Christians were weird people. But wow. It opens a door for Jesus to be able to work. It's a door because of our, te because why? Simply by the way we did things, the way we answered, set up the testimony of our life of what we have done. That's why I'm going to give you the last one. We, sh we respond, not react to questions about our faith. I hope you understand the difference. Responding and reacting. We tend to be reactionary people. Come on, we all are. We all are. And, and a lot of times we just up it, right, and it goes in both directions. This is how, come on, all the married people in the room should said, this is how we get into arguments that start over the dumbest things. Come on, we can, we can just own this this morning. It's okay. It's just church. 
safe place to be truthful. We do, right? We just, we, it, it, it started over a dumb thing. But what happened? I didn't respond because I'm bad at that, right? I reacted. How dare you think I did that? Well, then it's off, okay? Then it's, then it's just off because I did not respond. I reacted. And if we would be honest, this is how we tend to live. We tend to live reactionary instead of responding. Oh, let me answer why I have this hope in me. Instead of, what do you mean why I'm a Christian? Of course I'm a Christian. Anybody who's not a Christian is a, and then you're off, okay? And then you don't have the opportunity. So I want to urge you to think about not reacting to everything. Come on, come on. we see Facebook posts that we want to react to. We got to react. We got to react. There are times to respond and because of a relationship, you can actually talk to somebody and you can actually respond back to something. But we tend to be far, way too much reactionary people. And reactions, I, they don't, they, I, I just haven't had it go well. Now, you could tell me your story afterwards. A lot of you do this, okay? I love you for it. You could tell me your story, how you, ha- you reacted and it worked out great, Okay. Wonderful. It's never worked for me. So uh, if it's worked for you, please help me understand how it does. When I learned to respond, which, by the way, responding, you know, you know what one of the major differences is? Time. Time. I know you've got to answer now. Now, now, now. Do you know what happens when you put a little space there? Well, now I can think through things. And now I can respond. And I help, can help somebody. I can help somebody see an error. I can help somebody say, wait a minute, have you thought about what you wrote? Have you thought about where this is going? And we can actually help somebody further by responding instead of reacting. So here's what I want to leave you with this morning, that suffering leads to a deeper knowing of Christ and a greater dependence upon Christ. This is why he calls it a blessing. Do you understand what it means? It means you know Christ more. Paul said to be able to share in his sufferings, oh. and then to lean upon him for just the strength and the grace to make it through those moments. Gr- deeper knowing, greater dependence. Man, this is what Jesus wanted those first disciples to get. Yeah, I know. You guys have no idea what's coming. It's going to be It's going to be crazy. Okay, and next week is going to tell them, that's why I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, by the way. Okay, that's why I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, because you're going to need help in the midst of doing this. And so we're going to see that next week. We're going to see that, how he specifically basically talks about what's going to happen at Pentecost and after because of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit is going to come and do, what he will do. And so he goes, you know, he's not just leaving them alone. This all went together. But he's like, it's going to be tough but you will have a greater knowing of me. And you will have more dependence. You will lean into me harder than you ever have for the grace and strength that you need. So we're going to ask Jesus to help us with that today. A greater, a deeper knowing of him and a greater dependence upon him. That's what we're going to ask Jesus to do in our hearts and lives today. Whether you're going through this whether you're going through a season of suffering or suffering comes in the future, you are ready for a deeper of knowing Christ and a greater dependence upon him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, on that night, on that night, Jesus, with those men, you tried to help them to be ready for a world that would not embrace the message of the cross and the empty tomb. They would not. They'd call it foolishness. They would cast it aside. They would persecute and push back. Many of those men in that circle had no idea that night it would cost them their lives to follow this man, Jesus. They didn't. They didn't. But in those moments, you were preparing them. For when suffering came, they would be ready. And 
and to have Peter write years later about just the idea of how do we approach those seasons. Father, so, some are in those seasons. And some of us will experience those seasons in days to come. May we, may we understand that these seasons are a gift from you. That you would speak, that we would know you more. And that those are the seasons where we lean the hardest into you for the grace and strength we need. Jesus, what a greater gift than to be able to suffer for you. May you work and move in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name.